welcome everybody to this evening of uh, learning physics with conceptual and problem based approach organized by the national academy of sciences india nasi delhi chapter today we have with us once again dr shumala roy from a ugc uh, uh, ugc and an assistant professor from department of physics and astrophysics university of delhi dr shumala roy has been working as an assistant professor department of physics and astrophysics since 2016 he completed his phd in physics in 2012 from iacs kolkata jadavpur university and has served as a postdoctoral researcher in max planck institute of microstructure physics halle germany from 2012 to 15 and his research interests include experimental condensed matter physics physics of surfaces and interfaces in nanoscience he is the reviewer of national publishing group elsevier is also the member of german physical society and american physical society he has been the principal investigator for ugc funded project ugc startup grant for faculties joined under the faculty recharge program welcome dr roy i'm sure the students will enjoy today also your okay. detailed lecture yes, please you. please uh, share your screen yes yes, uh, yes. dr varsha stop sharing yes. please yeah, yeah just a second ma'am Oh, is it visible my screen? Yes, 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 yes. It is visible. Okay. Welcome. Ah, oh, thank you, thank you. Okay. Uh, so do we start now? Yeah, please, please. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, continuing from yesterday. Uh, so I will continue today the crystal structures. i named it as crystal structure 1 which is basically two dimensional and three dimensional lattices yesterday we talked about the, the 2d lattices mainly two dimensional lattices and we end up with uh, some uh, structure which was a non bravais lattice which is 2d honeycomb lattice uh, and i gave some introduction about it uh, and this is going to be more interesting because uh, as i said last year also this uh, the wonder material which is nowadays is a very uh, topical research graphene is of this structure on so uh, it will be more interesting but before that anybody has any question uh, you have about your status question uh, class uh, so if you have you can raise otherwise i am not going away so i will be there in tomorrow and day after tomorrow so you can ask me once again so i suppose there is no question i can proceed so you can ask any time and uh, as i said yesterday you can interrupt me if you have any uh, question where is in your mind uh, let me start so let me start with where we ended yesterday we said that this is a two dimensional honeycomb lattice is a, a non bravais lattice and why it is non bravais i said that for a bravais lattice it there two criteria has to be uh, uh, satisfied one is this transcendental symmetry and another is rotational symmetry which by which i mean that uh uh so uh, uh the by which i mean that that the, the an observer at any point of this lattice will see the exactly the same surroundings as the other observer which is the another point so in the other words the every lattice point is equivalent that is the definition of a bravais lattice but in non bravais lattice like in two dimensional honeycomb lattice as you see from here the point a the observer which is which is point a as see the observer who is at point a has on the on the on, uh, on the observer's left hand side another point is far away but the, this point b is closer to them while for the for the observer at b the left hand side this point is closer than the right hand side so it is exactly opposite to a and b for an a and b observer at a and b so this kind of lattice that means the point a and b are two non equivalent point and that's why uh, this is a, a non bravais lattice now but uh, then the question comes if it is a non bravais lattice but it looks like a hexagon like right? these are all regular hexagon 
but then why 2d hexagonal lattice which we discussed yesterday the hexagonal lattice is a bravais lattice and we discussed yesterday but here we see that the honeycomb lattice is not a bravais lattice why is it so has anybody answer for this yesterday we discussed 2d hexagonal uh, lattice uh, which was a bravais lattice and which fall under uh, the classes of the bravais lattice that is it, it is one of the five classes of this bravais lattice in two dimensions but here you see that this uh, uh, honeycomb lattice is not so you can write your answer yes you can write your answer in the chat box so what i have asked that see this uh, regular hexagon so why it is not the same as a two dimensional hexagonal lattice which we discussed yesterday and which is a part of the two dimensional hexagon okay if uh, you uh, okay, let me see if anyone answers if not let me give you some hint let us uh, draw the lattice points at the vertex of these hexagons okay so let us draw some uh, so this is to be honeycomb lattice now i i have drawn the lattice points are the hexagons now can anybody say now can anybody say what is the difference between this lattice point and the hexagonal lattice point so uh, for for your uh, for your uh, say recapitulation this was the 2d hexagonal lattice which we uh, discussed yesterday so we have a hexagon over here also and we have an hexagon over here also so what is the difference in the structure is there any difference so this is one and this is one. this one is is a bravais lattice and this one is a non bravais lattice so the question is what is the difference No, no. I mean, binding together or not doesn't matter. I just drawn the lattice point. I could have removed all the hexagons. I mean, this is not by binding. There is nothing binding. Exactly, Swati. Great. No central atom. Sri Lakshmi. Great. This is the answer. So there is no central atom inside the hexagon. You see, there is no central atom in the hexagon. But whereas in two-dimensional hexagon, we have a central atom over here. but if i we have a central atom over here at the center then what is the difference then you see at any observer here will see the same surroundings like the other observer at this point so the the difference between the two in equivalent point goes up if we have a central it is not atom it is a lattice point so always i am stressing on this fact these are all lattice point please try to remember these are not atoms these are lattice point i have not talked about atoms yet these are all lattice structure and lattice point there is certain difference when i say there is an atom okay uh, dr roy yes when you read an answer or a question from the chat box uh, then yes. um, please see whether it is visible to everyone or not otherwise suppose you are answering something but the question is not uh, not uh, addressed to everybody that means they will only listen to the answer without knowing no, the question uh, no i am not uh, writing anything on the chat box i am just getting the answer and i am just uh, saying those answer so that ah, everybody okay. can listen i mean so i mean uh, I they should know what you are uh, yeah, which was, which question yeah. you are answering okay 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 yeah. okay, okay. So that's what i am saying. okay so the main difference between this hexagonal lattice and the previously shown that there is a central lattice point over there and if we have a central lattice point that all the lattice points becomes equivalent okay so these are all lattice structure there is no atom in it okay that's good so uh, this is uh, okay another important conception over the here is a wigner c cell uh wigner c cell i have taken this picture from astrophon morbin anybody of uh, you can uh, sorry you can uh, go to the book yeah so sir lakshmi i told you this thing so there is no central please don't say it an atom i am telling you again and again there is no atom still now these are all lattice points 
So when you say there is no central atom in honeycomb lattice, that means you are saying there is a lattice, but there is an atom. So these are two different things. Okay. So uh, so uh, no central lattice point in a honeycomb lattice. That is the correct answer, as I say. That is the correct answer. Okay. So uh, uh, then this Wigner C cell, uh, uh, there is a, a important concept, Wigner C cell. Uh, Wigner C cell is uh, actually defined as the following. If you have a crystal lattice, lattice structure like uh, these are the black spots at the lattice points, then how to draw a Wigner C cell of it? So you take any of the lattice points, say, suppose this is the central lattice point, okay? And connect all the nearest level lattice points. Not nearest neighbor, neighbor's neighbor lattice points. Whatever be the neighbor, we just connect them. Right? You first connect them with these lines and then take a bi perpendicular bisector of each of these lines. You see, the connecting lines are the dashed lines and we have taken a perpendicular bisector which has formed certain region in this two dimensional space. This region is called Wigner C cell. Okay, so that is, I think that is very clear to everybody. Uh, so how do we, uh, how do we uh, form a Wigner C cell is the following, that uh, we take any point, we connect all, those, all these points to this, uh, the atoms in the vicinity, uh, not, not atoms, but the lattice point in the vicinity. And then the connecting lines that have the perpendicular bisector. If I perpendicularly bisect these lines, and these lines will form a, Region, which is what I Now, uh, certainly you may ask, why did you bring this conception of Wigner C cell? I mean, what is this? I mean, suddenly you will say this. Uh, you can, you could have said certain other region of space in the space. I mean, what is the importance? So the importance of Wigner C cell is you will see in the later on when you uh, study the Brillouin zones. So these Brillouin zones are nothing but the Wigner C cell first Brillouin zone, the Wigner C cell in the reciprocal space. So there the importance of Wigner C cell comes, but I have introduced it here because I will do some problem with it, okay? So this is the definition of Wigner C cell, and this comes important in the case of uh, when we study the Brillouin zone, because Brillouin zone, first Brillouin zone is nothing but a Wigner C cell in the reciprocal space. Okay, so with this, I go to the uh, next thing, which is very important. That's what I kept on saying that unless uh, uh, up to this time, I didn't say anything about atoms or molecules connected to lattice points. And now I am saying that a crystal structure, there is a basic difference between crystal structure and lattice structure. A crystal structure is only formed when we add a basis to the lattice points. So lattice, this is not only add, I mean, this is not a simple addition. This is called mathematical convolution. But I don't have time to explain you. I mean, the, in a bigger sense, what is mathematical convolution is. But in a loose sense, I mean, uh, in loosely, you can say this is lattice. When the basis added with each lattice point, we get a crystal structure. And what is what do you mean by basis? Basis are nothing but, um, but atoms, molecules, etc. So unless I am adding atoms and molecules to the lattice, each and every lattice points, unless I associate the atoms and molecules with each and every lattice point, I don't get a crystal structure. This is very important to remember. There is a basic difference between crystal and the lattice. So most of the time we loosely say that these are the atoms. There is no central atoms, as you say, but these are central lattice. Okay. Uh, and there is an example of this, uh, the, this, uh, uh, crystal, as we can see now, this honeycomb lattice, when we convoluted with this carbon atoms, they get the graphic crystal structure. Okay, uh, so these are the, uh, uh, this is the point. So, the, so the, now, if I say that these circles are nothing but the atoms, then it means that this is a crystal structure. It is no longer a lattice structure, it's a crystal structure which is made up of carbon atoms. And if I made up this carbon atoms, this is nothing but a graphene sheet. The graphene sheet has the same uh, crystal orientation or crystal structure. Okay, so that was the definition of a crystal. 
and this is a two dimensional graphene crystal now see there is a very important concept over there that uh, if i take these two atoms together say these two atoms this is a together is a unit similarly if we take all these atoms together one all this pair of atoms together now can you see a picture i mean uh, what kind of crystal it is now forget about this one this one forget about this one the topmost red oval except the topmost red oval can you see what is the structure of this if i only consider the red ovals and not the individual carbon atoms what kind of structure it is anybody centered hexagonal what is that <laughs> sejal there is nothing centered it's hexagonal itself is centered yes so it is right so this said is a hexagonal lattice there is nothing called centered hexagonal is centered because hexagonal there is a, as i discussed till now there is always a central lattice point in a hexagonal lattice so that means now this structure is if i take this two point together or two atoms together it is hexagonal yes it is hexagonal and then this taking two point there is a technical name to it it is called a two point basis these are called two point basis so this two point basis as you see it is it comes very handy very handy when you calculate the structure factor of different thing which we will may discuss in the future in the coming to classes uh, but uh, you should take it to mind this always if you have the two point basis somewhere the crystal structure reduces a lot that means it becomes a very simple structure and there are many instances where uh, i have like this instances if you take your basis correctly you can uh, take a non bravais lattice to a bravais lattice because here you see if you have taken two point basis it is a hexagonal lattice and hexagonal lattice is nothing but a bravais lattice okay so in order to see it visually that this is a hexagonal lattice it is a hexagonal so that is the importance of taking two point basis two point basis is a very important concept uh, will many ways will need it when we uh, calculate the structure factor because unless otherwise this uh, calculating structure factor will be very very complicated so don't take two two point basis for example in case of bcc crystal we if we take two point basis it becomes a simple cubic if we take a fcc lattice if we take the two point basis it becomes a simple cubic so all these things happens If we take two point basis, so two point basis is a very important concept in crystallography. Okay, uh, okay. Next one is so we now discuss a problem which came in uh, net exam in June 2011. Here there is a picture given, there is an image given to you, and you see there there are various vectors given like A, B, C, D. Everything is given, and you have to calculate the area of the Wigner system number one. And the Bravais lattice for this area. Okay. Now, first of all, let us uh, come to the first part: area of the Wigner system. Now, first of all, Wigner system. How do we uh, construct? I, I mean, looking at this, uh, can anybody guess which one the vectors will be the uh, basis vector for Wigner system? Whether it is a one, a two, or b one, b two, or c one, c two, or b one, b two. Just looking at this picture. you can write your answer in the chat box which one could be the a1 a2 okay sir some priyanka said a1 a2 uh, c1 c2 and you said b1 b2 so we have every possible answer only nobody said d1 d2 ah somebody said you also said d1 d2 okay so we have every possible answers and let us see what is the correct answer huh? okay so in order to see that let us zoom in one of the hexagon this is one of the hexagon of all these hexagons i have zoomed in okay and i have put some uh, 
say the lattice points, the blue colors lattice points at the y axis. Now, by the definition of whiteness C cell, what I have to do? Suppose I consider this atom, and I will connect this atom with all the nearest atom to it, like three atoms nearest to it. So I have to look at all. That. Now, when I call, uh, uh, connected all the atoms, so now I have to take the perpendicular bisector of these lines, connecting lines. This is the definition of whiteness is set. Now I am taking the perpendicular bisector. This is one of the perpendicular bisector. This is the other perpendicular bisector. This is the third perpendicular bisector. Okay. So you can see the radius spanned out by the uh, by the whiteness is cell is a triangle. If it is a triangle, can I say that these are the two basis vectors? This is one. And this is two. These are the two basis vectors of this triangle, whiteness is set. And if this is two uh, two basis vectors of this uh, whiteness is cell, that means these are which one? These are. Now, can you guess? Now you have to shift the, the two vectors only by the origin to see which are these vectors. I can shift these vectors to the origin O. And this will be the B1 and B2. So Anju was correct. So the basis vectors for the whiteness C cell will be B1. I hope everybody is clear about this. This is uh, simple. I mean, just uh, you have to uh, uh, say that the, what is the A whiteness C cell. So the whiteness C cell is uh, the basis vector for the whiteness C cell is B1 and B2. So if this is a B1 and B2, then the area of any area, uh, I mean, area of uh, span by two vectors, what is that? That is, uh, uh, we, we have, uh, we learned it from the vector calculus. What we have shift, you can shift with whatever you can shift, but here B1 and B2 is given to you. That's why I have shifted this to, so that it becomes a B1 and B2. So B1 and B2 is given to you, but you need always the two basis vectors. You cannot shift only the third one. So you have to shift two basis vectors because this area is spanned by the two vectors. Okay. Uh, what we shall we will get D2? No, we will not get D2 because then you have to take two vectors. If you take the straight line which is perpendicular, you have to take the another straight line also. And then it will be the two straight lines will be at, a, at an angle of 60 degrees. It will be not D1. D2. Okay. So you cannot take only D2. You have to take two axes, two basis vectors, which is D1 and D2. So in two dimension, you have to have two basis vectors. Okay. So the two basis vectors is B1 and B2. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, of course, I can show you once again. This is Shabna. So what I say, you see that this is the uh, uh, this is the Wagner C cell. Of the this uh, uh, honeycomb lattice, how do you how did you uh, get this Wagner C cell? As I said, the definition from the definition of Wagner C cell. Suppose I have taken this atom as the central atom and connected all the nearest atoms with it by a straight line, and then I took the uh, perpendicular bisector of the connection. And if I take the perpendicular bisector of the connecting lines, I get this dashed lines, this broken lines. And these broken lines form a triangle, which is the Wigner C cell. So in this case, the uh, Wigner C cell is a triangle. Now, if this Wigner C cell is a triangle, I can as well take the basis vector as one of this, and one of one like this. And if I do that, then the basis vector is nothing but you see the, the picture given in the problem. It is nothing but the two vectors v1 and v2 because you have to just now shift the origin. That's all. Okay, Swati so sir, what is the length of each side of the side of the triangle? How can we calculate the area? Area is calculated like this, as uh, you know, uh, if you have two vectors. The area spanned by the two vectors you know from the vector calculus is nothing but b1 plus b2 and i am taking the area as a scalar quantity so i have taken a modulus of 
the length of the uh, vectors will be the same as the length of the v1 and v2 you can you can just think of it it is very easy to see because i am just shifting v1 i am not changing any length or the direction because if you change the length or direction the vector changes the vector has both magnitude and direction so i am just shifting v1 and v2 i'm not changing that you okay, don't have to change the direction if you if you uh, if you think of it you take a pen and paper and take a perpendicular bisector of a hexagon with a regular hexagon you will see that you will get these two triangles is triangle and the vectors will be the exactly the same way hmm? and how can we calculate the area is v1 cross v2 this is known from vector calculus okay that's what we will do now we will calculate the area now in, to calculate the area you see that v1 and v2 were now i know if I, these these are the two vectors of wigner cell but now to uh, to find out this cross product what i have to do i have to uh, i have to express this v1 v2 in terms of some vectors some uh, in our cartesian coordinates in terms of i j k like vectors which are the unit vectors along x axis y axis and z axis if i can do that then i can take a cross product we well, you know how to take a cross product of that So, uh, now to do that, let us do this exercise. So now v1 and v2 are the two vectors. I take two axes, x and y. One is x, one is y. And uh, there is uh, these two vectors, v1 and v2. And and on the horizontal axis, you see the i is the unit vector, and the vertical axis j is the unit vector. Okay, so now we have to see what is the component of v1 along the x-axis, and what is the component of v1 along the y-axis. Similarly, what is the component of v2 along the uh, x-axis, and component of v2 along the y-axis. That's we have to do. Now, you see, in order to take the component of v1 along the x-axis, it is the component of v1 is of a length of OB. That's for sure. And how to find OB? OB is OA plus AB. Now AB is nothing but A, the lattice constant given to you in the question. And we have to find out just OA. And what is OA? If A is the hypotenuse, and what is the angle NOA? Yes. So, so what is the angle between this NOA? What is the angle? This angle? Anybody? N O A angle N O A. What is the whole angle of this hexagon? Hexagonal angle. I mean the angle here, the complete angle of a hexagon, complete internal angle of a hexagon. What is that? So Daisy, yes, you are correct. Yes, yes, yes. No. <laughs> what is your answer, Misha? Bem, I don't know. Uh, you said 360. What do you mean by 360? I said the internal angle. Yeah. So the internal angle is actually 120 degree. And now if you take the bisector of this by the x-axis, it becomes 60 degree. So the 60 degree is the correct answer. Now if this angle NO is 60 degree, then this OA is nothing but A cos 60 degree. Right? So OA is A cos 60 degree plus AB is A. So A cos 60 degree is A by 2 plus A, which is 3A by 2. So the component of V1 along the x-axis or the uh, ith vector axis is 3A by 2. Yes, but I asked what is the internal angle of each angle in the hexagon? So you must say it is a 120 degree. I never ask what is 2 pi by n something, just give the answer, correct answer. Okay, so uh, the thing is that we have calculated the uh, 2, 3a by 2 uh, is the component along i. So similarly, the component along y axis is the a sine 60 degree. So that is 3 root 3, 2 by a. Okay. So the whole vector, the V1 vector will be 3A 2 by 2I plus 3A by 2 into J. 
So take a pen and paper with everybody. Huh? So while we are doing this, we can calculate this. You can draw this. Otherwise, there is no meaning. You don't learn anything. So take a pen and paper. Just watching this, uh, you will see something. But while doing this, yes, sixty degree. Arun Mugam, thank you. So the uh, as I said, uh, so the component of B one along the x axis will be something like this. It's component of B one and B two. B one will be three a by two plus root three a by two. And for B two is for the x axis, the component will be the same. There is no difference. But the component along y will be in a negative direction, so it is a minus one. So this is root three a by two minus. So this will be the two vectors b one and b. Okay. So if now we have done this uh, b one and b two, now let us take the cross product. I think all of you can take a cross product of these two vectors. And if you take the cross product, you get the answer. Something like this. And this is the answer. This is the area of the wider system. So that is the that was the part of problem problem A. I mean the part A of this problem. And the next part is is this. This is a honeycomb lattice. You know, everybody knows this is a, a non-Bravais lattice. Now, if it is, if it can be treated as a Bravais lattice, then what will be the, which one will be the lattice and what will be the basis vectors? So suppose if there is a point, lattice point everywhere at the center of the hexagon, what would be the? Then the uh, basis vectors. That is very easy because if it is a hexagonal lattice, the basis vectors would be a one and a two. Nothing else. We have seen this many times in the past. So the C will be the correct answer. Hexagonal lattice with basis vectors C one. Yes, C Dinesh. Correct. So C will be the correct answer. It will be the hexagonal lattice with the basis vector C. And the C1, D2, C1, C2, D1, D2 has nothing. There are no meaning. They are they are to confuse you. Nothing else. Okay. Uh, this was a pro problem uh, which appeared in net. Now there is one more in, uh, very important concept of packing fraction. In two dimension. Now we said that we have come from a lattice structure to a crystal structure. So each lattice point is associated with the basis. Now we don't have lattice points anymore. In each lattice point, we have something, some atoms, molecules, or something. Some. Okay. So one thing very important which I missed, I must say that the each lattice point may not be uh, associated with only one atom or only one molecule. They can be associated with group of atoms, a group of molecules, right? Only thing that they has to be repeated in the lattice. So the basis is not only a single atom or a single molecule. Basis can be a group of atoms, group of molecules. Hmm? Uh, so now let us come to this uh, this conception. Actually, I this problem I have taken uh, from this problem. I will take take some conception also. So for, but first, for uh, for uh, for for the moment, let us solve this problem. The problem is hard disk of radius R are arranged in a two-dimensional triangular lattice. What is the fractional area occupied by the this lattice structure in the closest possible plane? Now, within a triangle, you see this is a triangle. The black one in the middle is a triangle, and we have hard disks which are of radius R. Uh, so this is a triangle, which is the lattice at the centers. Now within the triangle, how can we take the closest possible packing? So this is the closest possible packing. We cannot do uh, anything. Uh, I mean, the, we cannot pack more than this because Haitha said this is a hard disk, right? So every word has a meaning. So hard disk by hard disk, what I mean is you cannot deform the disks. 
so they can only touch each other you cannot deform them so if you cannot deform then you cannot go more than this you can you can just touch this at this point whatever force you give if they don't deform so that means some of the area which is the white area of this uh, inside the middle these are vacant so so the question is what is the fractional area of a pipe by the closest possible vacuum yeah so this is uh, we have to take a, so of course the full area is not covered in the within the triangle so we have to uh, find out what is the fractional area is covered now see this is a very easy problem actually so you what you can find out uh, what you have to find out is the area of the disk within the triangle and you have to find the area of the triangle and then take the ratio so that will be the fraction huh? so if i do this uh now this is the result so as you can see that each sphere for each sphere uh, not sphere but disk for each disk we have only one sixth part within the triangle rest of the part is outside the triangle only the one sixth part so if this is the one sixth part of this sphere disk then this is the area which is within the uh, within the triangle for each disk is 1/6 of pi r square now how many such disks are there three so 3 into 1/6 pi r square is the area which is covered by the disk within the triangle and below that and the denominator what we have we have root 3 by 4 a square where a is the lattice constant constant and what is the lattice constant you can see from the picture it is nothing but 2 and if you calculate this r square will be cancel out it will be pi root 3 by 6 which is nothing but about 0.906 now this number has a meaning because we uh, we physicists always try to find out meaning in every numbers because we need to correlate these numbers with the nature and what is this numbers this is this is if you take a percentage not in fraction it says that 90.6% within the uh, of the area within the triangle is covered only about 10% is left so almost every area within this almost 90% is almost within the uh, triangle a full area is almost covered and this is called a closest possible packing because you cannot get more than uh, covered area within this uh, say within this primitive lattices for any other area so what is this any other arrangement let us see another arrangement of packing this is another arrangement of packing so we can pack this uh, disk in such that they are touched by these two points and we have a square lattice but if it is a square lattice so how many disk we have within this one fourth of pi r square area we have and that is four of such disk are there Four into one foot of pi r square uh, divided by two r r square. That is pi by four, and pi by four is nothing but about seventy eight percent. So the seventy eight percent area is covered. So the less area is covered in this case. The closest pack of packing is uh, follows this triangular pattern. This is the idea we take from this problem. Okay. So the closest packing in two dimension is nothing but this triangle. Now, okay. So this we have done. But there is another problem came which is similar to this. There's a circular disc of radius one meter. Each are be placed on a plane so as to form a closely packed triangular lattice. The number of discs per unit area is approximately equal to one. This is almost the same problem, but in a different world. So here, what you have to do, you have to find out the number of discs per unit area. So the radius one meter is given to you. uh so this is uh, another uh, maybe a uh, um, very easy problems 
Uh, I don't know what is the answer, but anyway, uh, yeah, here I have this. So how do you do that? So similarly, we find out the what is the lattice constant here. Lattice constant Q R is equal to Q Q meter, Q meter, and what is the area of the triangle? It is root three by four a square, and a is one. So it is root three by four into four. Yeah, that is inverse of it, right? Right, say it. So that is uh, so. If you calculate this area of this triangle, it will be root three by four a square, and a is two is r. That is four r square, and r is one meter. So root three meter square. So area of the triangle is root three meter square. Now root three meter square. How many triangles are? How many discs are there in root three meter square? So this is. One sixth of each disc into three. So practically, there is half disc within the triangle. Yes, three by six. Good. So this is half disc within the triangle. So that means root three by meter square contains half of the disc. Then one meter square contains how many discs? That is the answer. So per unit area means the number of discs in one meter square. So this is almost equivalent problem. And uh, uh, this. Uh, so let us go from this. Uh, so as I said, that this is a triangular lattice. You see, I mean, let us extend the idea. So we have three discs formed in a triangular lattice. Now, if I if we uh, extend this triangular lattice in two dimension, what we'll get? Something like. We extend this triangle in two dimension. We get something like this, and we get something like this. This is nothing but a hexagonal lattice. You see, so you have four points of lattice points at the uh, vertex of the hexagon. Also, we have a point at the center. It is nothing but a hexagon. But we started with a triangular lattice, and now we have a hexagonal lattice. The reason is very simple. I mean, the, uh, because every hexagon has a uh, triangle. In it. I mean, it is always inside it, the hexagons. You can always hexagonal lattice. We can always have this triangular lattice inside it. So the reason is very simple. Now, but with this, uh, another uh, problem came in just because the flat surface is covered with. Non-valuable disc of same size. What is the largest fraction of the area that can? Be? I mean, this is the same problem which we have. Okay. So the largest area, uh, largest fraction will be the same, the highest packing fraction, and that will be the hexagonal close packing. It's called hexagonal close packing because the highest symmetry is hexagonal. So though there is a triangular lattice, can we can say it is actually an hexagonal lattice. This uh, within the hexagon there is a triangle always in triangle. So it has more inner meaning to it. So let us go back to our hexagonal lattice. Here we can see that we have a hexagon. That's for sure. But with this hexagon, we always have triangles. These are the triangles. So what does it mean? It means that whenever we have a hexagonal symmetry, the triangular symmetry is inscribed in it. Triangular symmetry. That means we have, if we have a six mm symmetry, you can always have a three mm symmetry within that. If there must be a three mm symmetry, if we have a six mm symmetry, that is the, uh, I mean, the message from this problem. Okay, now I think I have almost covered. Uh, uh, I mean, whatever I wish to cover from the two dimensional lattices, let us now move to three dimensional structure lattice structures. Now, one advantage of this while learning is that uh, for three dimension, because you cannot draw three dimensions so easily like a two dimensional lattice, but you can see if you start from two dimensional lattice, every idea, if you extend to three dimension, it will bring you the three dimension. So starting with three dimensional, two dimensional lattice is so important. So every idea of symmetry 
and the extension of this uh, symmetry and the classification of this symmetry. So actually starts from the two dimension. Now, if you can visualize or you can extend your visualization in three dimension, you will get all the three dimensional structures. So that is the way one should start with the two dimensional lattice structure. So three dimensional lattice structure, as I said, these are classifications are always based on the symmetry. And uh, I will not uh, go, I mean, too much within the symmetry because I have explained everything about the symmetry in two dimension. So all I can say that as we started with an oblique lattice in two dimension, we, here we start with a triclinic lattice. In triclinic lattice, everything is, I mean, everything is undefined. Means A1 is not equal to A2, not equal to A3, alpha is not equal to beta, not equal to gamma. Exactly like uh, our oblique lattice where A1 was not equal to A2 and phi can, could be anything. So it is the least symmetry among the all three-dimensional lattice structures. 14 lattice types we have, Bravais lattice types in, uh, in the three dimension. Uh, this 14 uh, lattice type in comparison to two dimension, we have 14 lattice types. In two dimension, we have five lattice types. In three dimension, we have 14 lattice types. These 14 lattice types are here described in this uh, table. I have taken this from just from uh, Kittel. So we start with the triclinic where there is nothing equal, nothing uh, there, all, A1 is not equal to A2. Now one by one, we are imposing symmetry in the problem. Like in case of monoclinic, we say that alpha and gamma are equal, which is 90 degree of beta. Orthorhombic, alpha, beta, gamma is 90 degrees, more symmetric, but A1, A2 is not equal. Next is hexagonal, A1, A2 is equal to the equal, and alpha, beta, gamma, eh, sorry, trigonal. Alpha, beta, gamma, uh, tetragonal. Alpha, beta, gamma is 90. Similarly, now, now we come to the most symmetric cases, cubic, trigonal, and hexagonal. These are very much symmetric. It is exactly like starting from the oblique lattice and coming to the square lattice and hexagonal. It is exactly like Okay. Now, each of these uh, system, lattice system has uh, number of lattices within them, like cubic has three lattice types, as all of you know, the simple cubic, uh, body center cubic and face center cubic. So like all this system has more uh, number of lattices within them. But I'm not going in details into it. You can find these details everywhere in almost all books. It is like one of these, uh, uh, this uh, list or the table I have taken from somewhere in the internet, you can find it. So these are everywhere. I'm not going into features. Rather, I move to some other problem where we were discussing this. We were discussing uh, this packing fraction in two dimension. So I thought it will be nice to discuss in three dimension also. And what could be better than this to start with the problem? This problem appeared in year 2016. So atoms which can be assumed to be half sphere of radius R are arranged in an FCC lattice with lattice constant A, such that each atom touches its nearest neighbors. Take the center of one of the atom as the origin. Another atom of radius R is then accommodated at a position of zero A by to zero without distorting the lattice. Maximum value of the ratio small r by capital R. This we have. Now this problem is again very easy. So since the, uh, now if I say a uh, face centered cubic lattice, all of you know must be know, I think all of you know, if you see one of the face, it will look like exactly like this figure. These circles are nothing but the atoms, which are considered as a hard sphere in this problem. So if we see one face of the face centered cubic lattice, it will exactly see that because Face centered cubic lattices, the lattice points or the atoms, if I atom, attach atoms with the lattice points, they are situated at the corners, also at the center of the faces. So if I see one of the faces, it will be exactly looking like this. Now the uh, if now I define the axis as this like y and z, so that the atom or the atom of radius small r has to be accommodated here at the position 0 a by 2 0. Now in this time, the particular Cartesian coordinate system where will be the zero A by two zero, it will be the 
there is at the middle point of the square at the bottom uh, bottom side that means somewhere here we have to fix a atom somewhere here so that its radius is such that it just touches them because that will be the maximum radius of this small group see i can even uh, i can accommodate a smaller atom than this but i cannot accommodate a uh, radius uh, at an atom with a uh, larger radius than this so this is the maximum radius i can have and if the radius is smaller then i can say that the radius is a a is the lattice constant which is the side of the square each side of the square is a i can say that a is equal to 2r plus or smaller isn't it if r is the radius of the small atom say now a is 2r plus r now from this equation i cannot find out the ratio of r and r unless i can express a as a function of r capital r or smaller if i can do that that a as a function of capital r or smaller then this equation is very easy you can uh, from this equation you can find the ratio of small and capital r okay uh, so uh, is there any relation between uh, uh, is there any uh, is there any uh, relation between this uh, this uh, lattice constant and that capital r or the smaller can answer in the chat box if the relation is there i mean what should be the relation so a is the side of the square and r is the radius anybody yes jahan ah it is 2 to the power to be something yes but whatever it is so how can i find out that the important is how can we find out that yes yes Pythagoras, very good. So we can draw a diagonal on this uh, square, and if I draw a diagonal in this square, the the length of the diagonal will be how much? Four times capital R, isn't it? R plus two R plus R. So the diagonal will be four times capital R, and the diagonal from this, yes. So Daisy said that. So the diagonal in terms of a is a root two, and in terms of r is four r. So you can equate a root two as four r, and we will find this a as a function of r. And if we can find a as a function of r, then the, from the equation you can take the ratio. This is an, another easy problem, but this is the maximum value of small r. Return. But this is easy. So uh, the the thing is that these are easy, but this also has some conception within them uh, that I have tried to discuss. Uh, let's see. But that's all. That's all I had for today. Uh, I think I have finished before time, but that is fine. You can ask if you have any uh, questions. Otherwise, I today for today I finish it here. You conclude it. Yes, sir. There is a question. Oh, there is a question, sir. Yeah. Is the value of packing fraction calculated by assuming spheres only an approximation? Because the basis can be basis can have multiple atoms, but and may not constitute a sphere. Yes, of course, of course. I mean. See, I mean, in this problem, they are they are saying that this is a single atoms, perhaps, and the atoms behaves as a hard sphere. It can be multiple. I mean, it can be a molecule also. So, if they are molecules, it will be more complicated. It will not so easy to calculate. Sometimes it is not even to calculate. It is so easy to calculate by hand. You have to have a computer to calculate the fraction, right? So, uh, this of course this is true. Yes. The spheres are only an approximation. Yes, of course. Okay.
any query students please write in the chat box yes please students any more care queries uh, dr varsha uh, varsha please check uh, the youtube i have checked ma'am there are no queries no more questions no okay. more questions sir okay fine so thank you so much dr roy yeah, it was you, indeed very patiently you have and the best part is this red word you know gate 2016 net <laughs> 2017 mm -hmm. you know even if somebody is not willing to give attention to that <laughs> particular numerical that red word will immediately you know uh, warn them better pay attention now <laughs> so yeah. that's very important you know this is human psychology yes so i personally think that uh, you know teachers should be definitely taught one paper of student psychology <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's true yes i agree and we generally rely upon our own experiences yes of course yes uh, you know what is the psychology of how to mm -hmm. catch the attention and so on so thank right. you so much dr roy Uh, you have finished just pleasure. in time just mm -hmm. in time thank you so much mm -hmm. and it is indeed because uh, these questions are very easy but then all you require is the correct yeah. trick and in the correct application exactly but to, uh, i mean more than that each uh, these problems are easy but these problems carries with them a conception so yes I mean, a conception yeah. yeah so if it is clear then you don't have to revise again and again and right. these questions will so become right, right uh, very easily right so you are thanked profusely by the students thank, <laughs> thank you, you so thank much you. <laughs> thank you to all of the students yeah so we look forward to another session with you tomorrow yeah thank you so much and now thank we you. have our next speaker dr